Welcome back to this third segment of the law session on contract performance and breach. Now, before the break, we were considering uh, certain uh, situations where you may be able to uh, see, treat yourself as discharged from the contract, but a, a contract may, in some circumstances, be discharged by a breach of contract. So then, a contract may be discharged where it is a breach of a condition, a fundamental breach of an innominate term, or where it has been repudiated. The effect, of course, of treating the contract as discharged, well, a contract may be discharged prospectively, but not retrospectively. So both parties then would be discharged from the obligation to perform from the date of termination. An innocent party may also sue for damages, both for losses sustained before and after the breach. Now, where there exists a breach, for example, um, you have to look at whether it is a breach of condition, uh, of an anonymous term, or a breach of a warranty. As if it is a breach of a condition, which is a fundamental term, this will enable the innocent party the right to repudiate the contract, so to bring the contract to an end. So the whole idea is... it. In repudiating a contract and you will hear it being repeated throughout contract law and it is certainly how you should write is that if the contract is repudiated it means it just brings a contract to an end so he can do that in addition to of course claiming damages now a contract cannot be discharged by a breach of warranty you may only be limited to damages now what if you anticipate the breach so what is the situation where there's an anticipatory breach? The fact is, I don't have to wait until you tell me that you're going to breach, or I don't have to wait until you actually breach. If it is that I see that the fact is now that you're going to breach, or you more or less tell me in circumstances clear enough, then arguably we're looking at an anticipatory breach. So where a party indicates their intention not to perform their contractual obligation, the innocent party is not obliged to wait for the breach to actually occur before they bring the action for breach. So, when we look at the uh, case of Hotster and De La Tour in 1853, the circumstances there was that the claimant agreed to be a courier for the defendant for three months. This was supposed to start on the 1st of June, 1852, but on the 11th of May, the defendant wrote to the claimant saying he no longer wanted his services and refused to pay compensation. Now, the claimant obtained a service contract elsewhere, but this was not to start until the 4th of July. The claimant brought an action on the 22nd of May for breach of contract. The defendant said, that there was no breach of contract on the 22nd of May as the contract was not due to start until the 1st of June. The court held that where one party communicates their intention not to perform the contract, then the innocent party does not have to wait until the breach has occurred before bringing their claim. They may sue immediately or they can choose to continue with the contract and wait for the breach to occur. Now, this, of course, gives the innocent party the option to either sue immediately or continue with the contracts themselves and wait for the breach to occur before bringing their action. This can, of course, be beneficial or it can be risky. Now, I'm going to mention a case, but I want to preface that case with a uh, with a with a point here. It is a House of Lords case. The case is actually White and Carter and McGregor. Uh, it's a 1961 case, so of course uh, you will see some things in there, of course, which may not be the same today. But the interesting thing about White and Carter, if I may. Uh, tell you an anecdote uh, and this is where I say to you that I do understand sometimes what it is like when you see a question in the exam because believe me I've been there and I remember once that we had a question well I had a question in a contract law exam which said an unaccepted repudiation is a thing writ in water and is of no value to anybody now, for the life of me, I could have sworn that the examiner must have picked this up from somewhere that had nothing to do with this syllabus. Of course, when I did get round to reading White and Carter later on in practice, 
which I had not done, I must confess, when I was at undergraduate level, I realized it was a quote taken straight from there. So the idea is that when you look at White and Carter, it's really a case about where a contract is repudiated, but you decide you are not accepting the repudiation. Now, the claimant had supplied bins to the local authority and were allowed to display advertisement on the bins. Now, the defendant owned a garage and the defendant's sales manager entered a contract with the claimant for them to place adverts on the bins for a period of three years. The agreed price was payable by three annual installments and if one of the payment was late, the whole price became immediately due. Now, the defendant had not authorized the sales manager to enter the contract and phoned the claimant on the same day as the contract had been made, telling them he did not want the advertising. Now, the claimant ignored the defendant's communication and arranged for the advertising plates to be made up and placed on the bins. Now, when the defendant got the bill, he of course refused to pay the first installment and the claimant submitted a bill for the full three years of advertising. Well, it went to the House of Lords and the House of Lords said that the claimant was not obliged to accept the breach of contract and could continue with the contract. They were therefore entitled to full payment for the three years advertising. I would suggest though that this case seems to ignore the general rule as it relates to the duty to mitigate loss applicable to claims for damages. Again, like I say to you, you would consider, if you get a question, it is certainly about White and Carter because it was, they had repudiated, the defendants had repudiated the contract, but they had not accepted the repudiation. Another case to consider is Avery and Bowden. Now in Avery and Bowden, but in a contract, the claimant was to carry cargo for the defendant. Now the claimant arrived early to collect the cargo and the defendant told them to sail on as soon as they did not to sail on as they did not have any cargo for them to carry and would not have by the agreed date. Now the claimant decided to wait around in the hope that the defendant would be able to supply some cargo. However, before the date the cargo was supposed to be shipped, the Crimean War broke out, which meant that the contract became frustrated. The claimant lost their right to sue for breach. Had they brought their action immediately, they would have had a valid claim. So sometimes it is not worth sitting around and waiting. The point, therefore, is that when you consider breach in the context of a uh, discharge of a contract, the courts will look to whether or not, for example, in the case of White, uh, White, and, White and Carter, you will see that they will not accept, for example, or uh, now, in recent times, uh, currently, you will find that the courts will not accept a situation where you don't mitigate your loss. Equally, if you wait, you may lose the right in the context of breach. We will pause and as we return, we will complete with this session on performance and breach. Mm -hmm.